Hi again. Um, today we're going to start on what well, we're getting kind of close to the end now of the B vitamins. So today we're going to do two. We're going to do B5 and B6. So starting with B5, which is also called pantothenic acid, um, this one has kind of, well, I guess more of a simple structure, I guess you could say. It consists of a beta alanine, Ooh, excuse me, um, combined with a pantoic acid. And then this is just joined by a peptide bond. So basically it's called B5 because it was the fifth vitamin discovered. And um, I'm going to go through, they basically did name all the B vitamins kind of like in order as they were discovering them or as they thought they were discovering them. Um, and I have, I believe it's in the next lecture in the full eight lecture where I kind of go over like the missing ones basically, but just in case you're curious. So what happened to B4? This was the fourth vitamin or so-called vitamin to be discovered. And it was actually adenine. So I'm sure you recognize adenine from, um, yeah, just in general, like biochemistry, molecular biology stuff. So early work on adenine was done by Herman Emil Fisher, and I guess there was just this race at the time to discover vitamins. And uh, yeah, they discovered this one. They kind of isolated it. Uh, they knew that it was a purine base and that had lots of different functions in the body. So it was obviously a component of ATP, DNA, RNA, so that's all the places you've seen it before. But then they kind of pretty quickly discovered that it's not essential. So basically our bodies can make it. So um, yeah, it's not an essential vitamin because we can basically make it pretty easily. So food sources, um, B5 is kind of a special one. Pantose, it actually derives its name from the Greek word for everywhere. And that's because you can basically find B5 in almost all foods. It's super widely distributed in nature, so it's found in a lot of like plant and animal products. And then just for this reason too, like it's really unlikely that somebody's going to be deficient in this. I don't think in your clinical practice in the U.S. or potentially in other countries too, if you decide to travel or work in other countries that it's not something that really pops up as like a clinical deficiency. Most people, if they're eating kind of um, an adequate number of calories can usually get B5 pretty easily. And then also we do find that, as I was mentioning before, that a lot of B vitamins are added, like enriched or fortified in grain products, but B5 isn't. I haven't seen many products where they've actually added B5. And again, that's because you can pretty much find it in most like plant and animal products. So here's just a list of typical things. Um, oh, I forgot to mention. So it's an AI, if you want to write it on this slide. Uh, it's an adequate intake level. They haven't discovered the RDA for it yet or solidified that. And it's five. So this one's kind of easy to remember. Um, it's yeah, B5 and it's five milligrams per day. So <laughs> for both men and women. Um, and then if you look at like pinto beans, you're getting about three per serving An avocado has two. So you can kind of quickly get, you know, with just like a few of these like products per day or just a few, um, servings of plant and animal products. You can kind of get up to your five milligram per day requirement pretty easily. What does cooking do to B5? Um, interestingly, I was actually able to find kind of more specific information, even though this vitamin is not very popular or well discussed or anything, they had a fair amount of like actual percentages for what happens with different types of cooking. So they found that it's a 40% loss with boiling, and that means not like that the vitamin's destroyed. But that just means that 40% of B5 will enter, uh, like leave the vegetable or whatever, and then enter the cooking water. So again, you will you can recoup that because the vitamin itself is not destroyed. It's just been kind of um, uh, released into the water. There's a 5% loss with baking. Um, so like 170 and over is actually going to destroy kind of, or start to destroy the vitamin 
And then there's about a 20% loss with like the higher temperature cooking. So 190 degrees Celsius. So that's like, you know, pressure cooking and barbecuing, that type of thing. But uh, it's still pretty good. With other ones, you're losing like almost all, with other B vitamins, you're losing almost all the vitamin when you're like grilling. But here you're losing about a fifth of, um, of B5. Canning, on the other hand, has kind of detrimental effects on B5. The majority of this vitamin is lost with canning. And I think that's because I actually don't do, I usually ask the class if they, if anyone does any like canning, but I think you need really high temperatures when you're kind of like, what else? It's almost like you're doing your own like self pasteurization with jars or something. So maybe that's why you lose so much of it. But um, obviously kind of with everything else, the best source of any kind of vitamin or mineral is kind of a fresh fruit or vegetable or um, yeah, just in this most fresh form, you're going to find the highest quantities of the vitamins and minerals. In terms of supplements, um, not super common, I have to say, again, just because B5 is found in so many different foods, you're not really going to see many uh, deficiencies or people with deficiencies. So um, I, to be honest with you, I really struggle to even find B5, like a bottle of B5 if I go to like a pharmacy. So I don't know, it's kind of, um, a fun thing you can, like, a fun pharmacy game you can play if you want. Uh, see if you can find an actual bottle of B5 because it's just not popular at all. Um, on kind of what I found more on the internet is that you can get it as calcium pantothenate. Uh, so that's just B5 and also panthe panthenol, which is the alcohol form of the vitamin. Um, but again, supplementation is not necessary. The majority of um, the U.S. population consumes the five milligrams per day. So again, I doubt you'll ever be purchasing or prescribing um, B5 to anyone. So the coenzyme form is actually coenzyme A. So which obviously really ties into its function. Coenzyme A, I'm sure you've seen everywhere in your biochem classes, Dr. Song's class, that type of thing. Obviously, I'll go over specifically uh, where you've seen this before. But just to show you first that when you make B5 into its coenzyme, so when you make it into coenzyme A, it's kind of a multi-step process and you don't need to memorize all these steps, but just to show you here, you're starting out with B5. So the one from like the first slide I showed you, it goes through several additional steps. So all the way, there's basically like a five step process here to transfer it into and to uh, CoA. And when we eat um, B5 in foods, 85% of what we're eating from the food is already in its coenzyme A form. So we're not really eating it as just the basic vitamin form. We're actually eating it as the coenzyme form already. So this is what coenzyme A looks like, kind of the final product of all these steps. And then just to show you here, this is the first vitamin we started out. So this is B5, kind of again from the first slide. So coenzyme A is pantothenic acid, or B5, plus a beta mercaptoethylamine, and then also an adenosine 3,5-bisphosphate. So it's basically these three components make up coenzyme A, which again is the um, uh, kind of active B5 form. Digestion occurs in the proximal intestine because remember most of what we're getting for food from foods is already in this CoA form. And then basically it takes lots of different steps to kind of cut the CoA down and render it back into its most basic form. And then the enzymes involved with this are basically phosphatases and pyrophosphatases. And then just like pretty much most of the B vitamins, uh, there is one exception, which we're going to talk about in the next um, the next lecture, but almost all of them follow the same pathway. So just to kind of remind you, what uh, if you're taking in really high intakes, will the body expend energy? No, it won't. So basically, it's using passive diffusion, um, and then at lower to normal intakes of B vitamins, will the body um, expend energy? 
Yes. Yeah, it will have some type of resource or energy dependent process. So here it's a sodium dependent transporter. Specifically, it's the sodium dependent active vitamin multivitamin transporter. And then you'll see in your biotin lectures that um, this is also used to transport biotin into the entire site. But yeah, nothing too surprising here for absorption. Um, in general, it kind of follows the same pattern that we saw with like vitamin C and other things. If you're just consuming kind of like normal amounts, so like five milligrams or around like what the average person consumes or just like, I guess, well, that would probably translate into maybe like one milligram or so per meal. You're going to absorb about 50% of the B5. But if you're taking in like higher amounts, so if you're taking in like an actual like capsule or tablet form, supplement form of this, the absorption will go down. So again, the body only wants a certain amount of vitamins. You can't like hyperdose your body just because you want to or just because you think that having a ton of vitamins in your body will like make it better somehow. Your body will not let that happen. It basically either won't absorb it or it will just quickly excrete it once it actually gets in. So uh, in terms of transport, a lot of it is um, transported attached to red cells. And then some of it also kind of just floats around in the blood in the free form. In terms of how it is absorbed into tissues, um, B5 is generally in pretty high quantities or in the highest quantities in the body, in the liver, the brain, and the heart. And then it's a sodium dependent transporter that's used to um, get it into these specific tissues. And then in, it's basically found in small quantities everywhere. And remember that the B vitamins, you know, they're definitely in higher quantities in certain tissues, but because they're involved in such basic functions of the body, like energy metabolism, so Krebs cycle glycolysis, so any cell that needs to like harvest energy, which is pretty much every single one, will have small quantities of all the B vitamins in it. So, you know, just to, to keep on reiterating that, that it, they're literally found everywhere just because they help um, harvest energy or they help with energy metabolism. Um, and then in other tissues, it's facilitated diffusion to get into uh, those cells. And so remember, the main thing that it does is it's really a, it's a component of coenzyme A. So that's the coenzyme form of B5, coenzyme A. And then just by knowing that, and you might be able to even just off the top of your head think of some areas in your previous courses of uh, any type of metabolism, if you remember where you saw CoA before. But basically every time you saw it, that was B5. So I like... You know, I have to admit, like, the B vitamins are kind of boring, but I like how they're, like, these little secret vitamins that are basically distributed all across, like, the Krebs cycle, you know, and electron transport chain. Like, every time you saw FAD, it was really riboflavin. Every time you saw NAD, it was, like, secretly niacin. So, I know, I always found that kind of interesting. Um, and then, yeah, CoA has always secretly been B5. So, surprise. Um... <laughs> So anyway, so the active site where CoA binds um, to acyl groups is right here. And if you remember again from your biochemistry classes that the main thing enzyme CoA, that coenzyme A does is transfer acyl groups. And those are basically these kind of like carbon compounds. They run from anywhere from 2 to 13 carbons long. And it's kind of just something that moves carbon compounds around, and those are needed for various cellular reactions. So to give you kind of a bit more detail, or if you want to see what an acyl group looks like, just to remind you, it's a functional group de derived from carboxylic acid. And then these carboxylic acids really occur, you know, just through normal metabolism. So they're kind of like occurring in our body or being made by our body constantly. And specific examples of these acyl groups or carboxylic acids that are made, or sorry, that are transferred by B5. So there's acetic acid, that's the two carbon one, malonic acid, the three carbon one, probionic acid, three carbons, uh, 
methylmalonic is the four and the succinic is um, four carbons as well. So again, coenzyme A, what does it do? It moves these guys around from basically one, you know, like a substrate uh, to a product, that type of thing. So specifically, what are some of the reactions where we've seen coenzyme A? So one thing that we've talked about um, before is the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. So whenever you saw acetyl-CoA, which I know you definitely recognize, that is B5. So B5 is a component of this. And then also in the conversion of alpha ketoglutarate to succinyl-CoA, obviously there's a CoA involved there as well. So in that step of the Krebs cycle, which we talked about um, in the Thiamine lecture as well. And then obviously when you're making lipids, so specifically cholesterol, remember that starts with acetyl-CoA basically and then it goes into methylonate, etc., and then all these different steps. But a basic building block of cholesterol is acetyl-CoA. So in order to excrete it, basically it's just excreted like most B vitamins in the urine. So what you'll find is definitely water-soluble vitamins, no surprise, as I mentioned before. The majority of them are excreted just through the urine. Whereas when we get to the fat-soluble vitamins, you'll see that some of them are definitely still excreted a little bit through the urine, but there's a kind of more, they're more so excreted through the feces. So that's another pattern to kind of see, or to, that you might slowly pick up on. So there's no metabolites um, that are made. We actually just kind of break it down, so release it from CoA back into its basic B5 form and then just excrete it intact through the kidney. So the kidney doesn't need it to be converted into metabolites for it to recognize that it needs to be excreted. It will just know that kind of, we probably get so much of this anyway, or that the kidney knows to kind of just let it go when it filters it. And again, the AIs, as I mentioned before, kind of easy to remember, it's five and five for men and women. And that's kind of how I memorized it um, for B5. And then the reason that there's an AI, so remember adequate intakes are used in place of RDAs when there's just not enough scientific evidence to um, kind of support like a true intake level. So here there was just insufficient data to relate intake to deficiency disorders. Um, and there's just, in all honesty though, there's really not a ton of funding for like vitamins these days. <laughs> like I work, you know, I apply for grants all the time and right now, uh, well, yeah, right now it's all like obesity, diabetes, that type of thing. So I think it's, I don't know how much research is actually still actively going on about B5. Maybe some labs, but I don't know of any. In fact, I don't even know of any in our nutrition department where people are studying like vitamins or minerals. It's kind of um, like an antiquated thing. So this is the deficiency disorder. Uh, it's called burning feet syndrome and kind of has twofold, two different things happen. Um, both really, really typical of um, B vitamin deficiencies. So what are the two major things you see in B vitamin deficiencies? Neuropathy, so neuro stuff, and what's the second one? Dermatitis. So you're always going to see some type of dermatitis either around the mouth, it can be on the limbs, but more typically kind of on the face. And then neuropathy starting with like tingling of like toes and fingers, that type of thing. And then that can lead to full blown paralysis if it's not treated. But burning feet syndrome is an interesting one because with B5 deficiency, both the neuropathy and the um, dermatitis seem to be primarily on the feet. And then you get this kind of dermatitis where your skin peels, so it kind of looks like you actually had a burn. And at the same time, you have this numbness, but it's also associated with like kind of a burny neuropathy, I guess, like a burning feeling in the feet. Uh, it's exacerbated by warmth and then it diminishes with cold. Um, you can, it will basically be fully corrected from my understanding, 
once you um, supplement the person with B5. So it is something that's correctable. Um, I haven't heard of anything where it, it did turn into full-blown paralysis. But again, I you know, it's so rare that I don't know if there's even that much documentation about um, what happens when people have, uh, yeah, when people have this disorder. And then always remember too, I have it here, most B5, or most B vitamin deficiencies all kind of occur together because they're so interrelated in their metabolism and function that when you start kind of decreasing intake of one, you know, the, it's kind of like the snowball effect where you kind of create deficiencies of all of them. So always supplement with a B, with a B complex instead of just like one of them. So who is at risk for this? Pretty typical um, alcoholics, the elderly. Here I just wanted to show um, another major thing is people with malabsorption disorders are kind of at risk for all vitamin and um, that's one group that you'll probably be working with a lot in, in clinics or hospitals that really need help with um, absorption. They have uh, I know it's kind of it's kind of a nasty photo, but I did want to show you kind of what full bloom Crohn's disease looks like and why people don't absorb things. So typically, inside the intestine, this is all like smooth, but then when with full bloom Crohn's disease, it becomes like so inflamed that none of this tissue is able to actually actively absorb anything anymore. So all the food coming through here just basically like passes right through because there's all of the um, enterocytes. Just their structure and function is so, um, it's just like desecrated, honestly. It just can't do that anymore because it's just so inflamed. Um, kind of as an aside, it, it, it there are really great medications for this now. They used to treat Crohn's with surgery and take out parts of the intestine, but then they found that it just kind of popped up other places. So now there's all these like anti-inflammatory um uh, infusion kind of medications that they put people on and that's what I'm on too for my Crohn's and it works amazingly so uh, once people are on a good medication regimen usually then they don't have you know mineral vitamin deficiencies because all the inflammation goes down the uh, intestine starts to look normal again and for the most part unless it was severely damaged um, if there's like still a lot of uh, yeah, basically still a lot of damage. Um, for the most part, people, people can like absorb things again. So, but for people where the medications don't work, then dietitians definitely have to work with them to try to figure out ways to, um, get the nutrients in their body. So yeah, it's kind of a long winded way to say malabsorption disorders are definitely people at risk. Um, alcoholics and the elderly. So remember it's always like decreased food intake, decreased absorption, and then diabetic patients have also been shown to have increased excretion of B5. So another kind of group to keep in mind. Toxicity um, hasn't really been established. Uh, there has been, remember, this is kind of, they figure out these things. They don't run studies on toxicity because it's unethical. So what they do is they usually just have case reports of people coming into the hospital who have said, uh, oh, I just took this massive dose of B5 or whatever it is. And this is what I feel like. Um, so they have had certain people come in. I guess they were a bit worried. They took 10 grams for six weeks. I'm not sure why, but there was no problems reported with that. And then intakes of 20 grams. Um, so double that. So um, yeah, 20,000 milligrams and compared to the five that you need per day for six weeks, did result in mild intestinal distress, so some GI disorders, um, but still nothing much more than that. So kind of just like not feeling, not feeling great having some GI problems. But yeah, that's 4,000 times the recommended intake and still nothing. So it's pretty interesting how quickly our bodies can get rid of it. All right, moving on to B6. So this one... This vitamin confuses people because it's pretty much the first time we talk about vitamins. And if you remember, we talked about this in the introduction slide. Maybe you can go back. It's basically one of the very first slides that we looked at. So vitamins are things that have kind of similar structures, but different functions. And in the case of B6, it has three vitamins. So what that means is there's three compounds in nature these three that all have B6 capabilities or functions. And they look, 
I don't know. They look kind of similar, but they do have, when we go, they have kind of different functions when we look at what they actually end up doing. So these three things each have, um, yeah, the functional capacity basically of B6. And so the first one is called peroxidine. Abbreviation is PN. And then uh, it's the alcohol form. Peroxidal, PL, is the aldehyde form. So it has an aldehyde here on that. And, and then there's pyridoxamine, PM, has an amine group here, an amine group. And then the way that you convert each of these into its active coenzyme form is actually pretty simple. All you do is add a phosphate group on. So each of these, again, there's three different vitamers for B6. Each of them become kind of their own coenzyme. So maybe put an arrow here, arrow here, arrow here, if that helps you. And then in order to make it into the active coenzyme, all you do is take peroxidine, PN, and add a phosphate group. So all this is is this exact thing with a phosphate group. For this one, peroxidal, you're just adding this phosphate group. Same with pyridoxamine, you're just adding this phosphate group. So yeah, it basically makes each of them make their own coenzymes, which is PNP. PLP and PMP. So you're just adding a P onto the end of those. Um, food sources, kind of, uh, I'd say it follows the whole meats and grains thing. Um, you know, it's kind of found a little bit everywhere. The um, RDA for this is 1.5 and 1.7. So 1.5 for women, 1.5 for men. And, sorry, 1.7 for men. And um, yeah, I, from what I found, like typical, a lot of grain products are fortified about 25 to 30 percent with B6. So it is something that you will see um, fortified or enriched um, on a lot of the grain products we eat. And then it's found in a bunch of different things, but definitely meats and grains seem like um, they contain pretty high amounts. So all six forms of vitamin D. B6 are found in foods. So what I mean by that is the actual kind of basic vitamin forms. So these are the three that we first looked at. These are just the basic B6s. And then also all their coenzyme forms. So each of these you can eat. Like you're, when you're eating a food, you're pretty much eating the normal form or just the basic B vitamin form, B6 form, and then also its coenzyme form. Um, in plant products and in rich grains and stuff like that, they enrich things and then they have it also naturally in plant products as pyridoxine, the PN form. And then what do you do to that to make it into its coenzyme form? Yeah, the phosphate group, that's it. Yep. So this is also found in its coenzyme form just naturally in the foods. Whereas the animal products are the ones that have the two other forms of B6. So that's the PL form, pyridoxal, and then the PM form, the pyridoxamine. And then their coenzyme forms where those phosphate groups have been added are also found in animal products. So when we're eating foods, we're eating not only just the basic forms, but also the coenzyme forms. And then you notice that too, remember, with like B5, you're actually eating like coenzyme A. So... Well, and then also some B5, but coenzyme A is the main way that we'd get it. So yeah, just to point out, you know, you're not always just consuming the basic vitamins. Sometimes you're actually eating it, the vitamin in its coenzyme form. What does cooking do to B6? Um, a lot of it's lost with boiling again, so most of it will kind of seep into water. It won't be destroyed, however, unless you kind of... Um, start to raise the temperature up past 190 degrees Celsius where you're going to start to see um, disintegration of the vitamin itself. Um, it's also pretty susceptible to canning just like B5 so you are going to lose the majority of B6 with canning and I think that's just the kind of heat and pressure involved with canning. So same thing fresh fruits, vegetables, grains, that type of thing are definitely the best form to, to kind of get the most Kind of bang for your buck in terms of like vitamin, I guess. Um, absorption. So just to point out again, you have the three different vitamins. 
they have phosphate groups attached that makes them into their coenzyme form and you have to remove the phosphate group so get it down to its most basic form the PN, PL, and PM in order for it to basically get absorbed into the uh, enterocyte. And the thing that helps break off the um, phosphate groups is alkaline phosphatase and that's just found on the surface of the enterocyte. So once the three types of B6 are in their most basic forms, they can be absorbed and interestingly most of it's absorbed by passive diffusion. So a little bit different from the other ones um, but yeah a lot of it or the majority of it's absorbed by passive diffusion and they haven't really isolated um, a transporter for it yet so you know maybe at super low intakes there's a transporter involved but that hasn't been isolated yet once it enters the blood it goes specifically to the portal blood bound to albumin and then travels to the liver and then when the vitamins of B6 get to the liver, basically they're built back up to their coenzyme form. So most of it, I know this looks kind of complicated, but all it's showing is that you have these three types, PN, PM, and PL. And most of the body, PLP is the form, so that's the coenzyme form that is kind of most functionally, it can be, that's the form that can be used in like all the different functions. So the liver will convert almost all these things into, first of all, PL and then into the PLP form. So that's kind of what I'm trying to show you here. So in order to make it into PLP, what happens is the PN form and the PM form are phosphor phosphorylated by kinase using ATP. And then basically what's happening there is it becomes um, PLP. And then um, the PMP, or sorry, the PMP and the PNP are then converted to PLP by the, this um, FMN dependent oxidase. And so remember, where did you see this before? That's basically um, B2. So FMN is riboflavin. And so riboflavin, in order to help kind of do this final conversion to PLP, you need riboflavin to do that. So yeah, riboflavin's involved with basically helping B6 become its most kind of important coenzyme. I guess you can kind of see it as that. And then so the main things that happen, or the main final things, is that the liver then releases the PL form, but primarily the PLP form and then distributes that to the rest of the body so it can do yeah its job as a as a coenzyme of that vitamin. So what does B6 actually do? Um, it's kind of hard to remember honestly it's one of those ones that are like not that easy <laughs> once you've kind of graduated the course you're like oh yeah what does B6 do because honestly it's not super exciting. Um, B6 is involved with amino acid metabolism. It does three major things so it's involved with transamination, and if you remember from your biochem classes, that means moving amino groups from one amino acid to another. Um, and then it's involved in decarboxylation, so that's just when you're removing a carboxyl group from an amino acid. And lastly, it also does, involved in um, deamination, so the removal of an amino group from an amino acid. And then if you look here, PLP is basically one of the coenzyme forms that can do all of these, whereas the PM and the PN form can only do a few of them. So that's why the body's making it mainly into PLP, because it can do these three different types of amino acid, um, uh, acid metabolism or just transfers, that type of thing. So specifically, what are some actual reactions that involve B6? So one transamination reaction is um, basically it involves the enzyme glutamate oxaloacetate trans transaminase. And so what's happening here is that it's also called GOT, that enzyme. GOT catalyzes the transfer of an amino acid from glutamate to a keto acid to generate a new amino acid. So again, very simply, all it's helping to do, B6 basically is just moving this group 
over to another one. So transamination is just moving in that group from one to another. And then again, it's all here if you just want it kind of in words what exactly that means. So moving one amino group to um, another amino acid. Decarboxylation reactions, uh, an enzyme that's involved with that is DOPA decarboxylase. And so remember, decarboxylation really just means like literally cutting off a carboxyl group. So in this case, that enzyme is um, basically taking L-DOPA, cutting off that carboxyl group so it becomes dopamine. And then lastly, it's also involved in deamination reactions. So that again is when you're removing an amino group from amino acid. So an example would be of an enzyme would be threonine dehydratase. And so with this one, you're starting with L-threonine that already has this amino group on it. The enzyme comes along, basically cuts off that amino group to give you a 2-oxobutanoate. So again, just cutting off an amino, which is different though than if we go here, this one's transferring the amino groups. And then this one is just deamination, so literally completely removing it. And PLP is the main one that basically does all these things. Urinary excretion um, is the main, you know, the main way that we get rid of this one as well, so no surprise there. This one does need to be converted into a metabolite. The metabolite is called 4-pyridoxic acid or PIC. And, you know, it's interesting because a lot of a lot of times it will have to, whatever the vitamin is or the coenzyme form, will have to travel, travel to the liver or kidney to be made into the metabolites. But in this case, I guess once the tissue is kind of done using the, the B6, the tissue itself kind of converts it into the metabolite, this PIC metabolite, and then it travels through the bloodstream and is eventually um, excreted by the kidney. So DRIs, remember, uh, for females, 1.5. For males, it's 1.7 milligrams per day. B6 does have an RDA, so remember, B5 didn't. That was the AI. And then the rationale was just, from what they could tell, is that this is the amount that will maintain adequate plasma levels. So basically, you know, it can do its function in um, amino acid metabolism. Deficiency is very rare, so very similar to kind of um, what we saw with B5. It did happen a lot in the 1950s, though. I was reading that they would kind of severely, they would do severe heat treatment of infant milk, so both breast milk and then, I guess, formula, and what happened was that the heat processing resulted in a reaction between PLP and lysine. Um, so basically, they just bonded to each other very tightly, and it made the the PLP inactive or just unusable. Um, I haven't heard of that happening at all recently, so I don't think people do that anymore. Um, but at the time when that was happening in infants, what they started noticing was kind of the typical things you'd see would be vitamins, so glossitis, so tongue kind of dermatitis, tongue issues, chelosis, and then the neuro stuff like seizures and convulsions. So just remember the main things you're looking, if you have, or to kind of back it up a bit, like if you have somebody that comes in to your clinic or office and is presenting, you know, saying like, oh, my fingers are a little numb. I, you know, I have this weird rash around my mouth or like I've lost all of the papillae on my tongue or, you know, my tongue is inflamed or I have like peeling on my tongue or some type of rash around the mouth that should instantly clue you in that there's probably some type of B vitamin deficiency happening there. So a lot of the times you're going to see a little bit of, of all these things. Dermatitis on, on the face, tongue, you might see it on the extremities in combination with the numbness of the fingers and toes. So kind of typical toxicity symptoms for B6. Toxicity is actually, this is probably one of the only ones where I would say that should be taken like pretty seriously. With most of the water-soluble vitamins, we can excrete it super quickly, so toxicity is not really an issue, as you probably noticed for most of them. Um, however, B6 can be highly toxic. So normal intake, you know, hovers around like 1.5 milligrams, 1.7. When people take 100 milligrams for several months, 
that's been associated with kind of devastating effects like sensory and peripheral neuropathy. And then actually the degeneration of dorsal root ganglia in the, spi ganglia in the spinal cord. So it can actually degenerate your spinal cord. So it's not um, something that you want to play around with. Or if you have friends that are just taking this in really high amounts for fun, please tell them to not do it. Um, however, kind of smaller doses than that, so less than 100, are sometimes used to treat um, carpal tunnel syndrome, um, premenstrual premenstrual syndrome, depression, muscular fatigue. I haven't seen, I don't know, I haven't seen many clinical trials that have shown that it's that effective. Um, so I haven't really shown that there. I, I wouldn't say there's science to support those, but as long as they're not taking over 100 milligrams per day, I think overall they should be safe. Um, one thing that it is used for more commonly is decreasing nausea it, during pregnancy. So when women are really pregnant with morning sickness in the first few months or maybe throughout their whole pregnancy, um, B6 has been shown um, to actually help decrease nausea a little bit. Um, it's just one of the first steps that the, that obstetricians will use to help decrease nausea. So it, it is okay for that. Um, obviously, work with a doctor before you describe prescribe B6 for um, any nausea. Just make sure it's not going to interact with anything else, and then also make sure they're definitely not taking more than 100 milligrams per day, no matter what um, what they're using it for. So what are the two major, um, uh, yeah, what are the two major things that B vitamins do? That's right, <laughs> energy release and the formation of blood components. Hopefully you remember that. Um, cause those are honestly probably the main things you're going to remember from the B vitamins. They're so intricate and they're so complicated that, um, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's really, really hard to remember exactly what they each do. So just to do the last two in terms of a mini review here, we don't have to go through all of them right now. So B5 and B6, where do you get B5 from? Is it the meats and grains thing? No, it's more everywhere. So it's all, whoops, it's basically you get it from, you know, it's pantos for everywhere. You can get it in most foods. B6, yeah, that one follows the meats and grains. Function, what does B5 do? All you have to do is remember what its coenzyme form is, and then that should clue you in. So coenzyme A, so it's involved in making cholesterol, basically all these different rules around the Krebs cycle. And then B6, what does that one do? That's all that like amino acid metabolism stuff, so transferring stuff around, basically. What's the deficiency disease for B5? That's the burning feet syndrome one, and then B6. It's basically glossitis or the typical dermatitis and neuropathy you'd see with any of the other B vitamins. So nothing doesn't have like a distinct um, disease. Toxicity is B5 toxic. Not really. It's not established. Is B6 toxic? Yes, absolutely. So that's pretty much the only like dangerous B vitamin, I would say. That's the one that can basically degenerate your spinal cord if you take too much of it. Even though people do treat, use it to treat um, nausea and stuff like that, you know, don't let them go over the 100 milligrams per day because it is quite dangerous. Great. All right. Well, I will see you at the next lecture and have a great rest of your day.